Populism around the world is on the rise and its very narrow vision threatens the globalization movement which so much of global trade depends on. From the Philippines with President Rodrigo Duerte to the President-elect of the United States, Donald Trump. This is The Money Makers. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Tonight I'm joined by the former Finance Minister, the Deputy Chairman of Rothschild South Africa to discuss global threats and the dangers they pose for the South African economy. What do you make of Donald Trump? Oh. <laughs> I mean, he's still an obscene billionaire. <laughs> I'm not so sure how many billions there are, no. but he's been able to carry off anything like he's carried off the campaign. Um, what people who follow this stuff very closely are all aghast about is nobody quite knows what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. I know that one of the uh, broadcasters has published a list of 30 commitments that he made during the campaign, uh, but which of them will see the light of day? Because the one's more obscene than the next. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think we're in for, a, for an interesting time. I mean, uh, I heard Neil Ferguson say that uh, never before in the history of the United States has there been a president who hasn't been close to office. Well, he's not ever served in public office. Right. He's never served in the military. Right. And every American president to date has done one of those two things. Or both. Or both. Um, well, he, he, he went to a military high school. Yeah. But that count. was probably for reasons <laughs> of discipline. <laughs> <laughs> and where he had, and had a decent haircut. But, but it is interesting how the world has changed in terms of the way politics is changing. And Neil Ferguson, you refer to him, and he talks about the five pillars upon which a demagogue is able to build populism. Um, amongst those those are immigration, 1970, 5% of Americans have been born outside of America, now it's 14%. Mm -hmm. um, the thought of corruption mm -hmm. is another one, and, and there are a couple of other pillars upon which populism uh, c can rise, and all of those pillars are in place, not only in America right now, but possibly across a lot of Europe. Well, you see, I mean, part of the difficulty, of course, is that we, we, we moved along into a, 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 a system, a sense of globalization without any rules. Mm -hmm. And the institutions that, that, that had governed us were all born out of circumstances that were created as a bulwark against mm -hmm. certainly uh, the, the populism in Europe of that, that led to World War I mm -hmm. and then World War II. Um, so, so, so all of what uh, Keynes writes about the economic consequences of the peace then uh, finds resonance in Nazism and we lived through World War II it's ended, I suppose, on a very high note with uh, a system of, of multilateralism, the United Nations, the Bretton Woods institutions. Uh, the UN gives mm -hmm. rise to a charter of rights, uh, and that's the world we grow up in. And along with that, systems that continue to break down walls, uh, and so you've got increasing trade, uh, less movement of people, uh, certainly much faster uh, financial flows, and then technology into the picture. Uh, but all of it happening without rules, and now we sit in a position where, in many ways, whether this be the, 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 the naked populism that, that produced both Brexit and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the Trump presidency, or the crudeness of uh, President Duterte in, in the Philippines, mm -hmm. or just the, the, the sense of, of refusal to bow to rules, at universities as we're seeing in South Africa. I mean, people elect uh, an SRC on one day and the following week mm -hmm. rail against that very SRC. Um, th there, there's a kind of, there's a, there, there's a sense of anarchy. It's a sense of trying to operate without rules. It's a, it's a worrying feature. Um, but there are very few leaders in the world who rise and can convene a presence that's very different. And I think that was, that was substantially different at the end of World War II, when leaders convened uh, and, and agreed on institutions and then rules. The, the, the horror of World War II was so fresh and so raw in the people who created the United Nations. Jan Smuts, of course, was part of that. Nobody ever wanted to have that kind of war again. But most people who uh, went onto the beaches of Normandy in June 1944 are either very old or dead. Yes. Um, we've forgotten just how horrific it can be. Yes, but also uh, the sense of the present is that wars are going to be very different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't think it's going to be, I mean, it's going to be quite the same trench warfare. I interrupt myself mm -hmm. because uh, part of what you're seeing in, in Syria, in Syria is, and is Iraq right now, old it's old-fashioned trench mm -hmm. warfare. Uh, but, but 
essentially between between states it's unlikely to to take on the same form um, you know even when there are the kinds of threats you've seen in the South China Sea they kind of find a way of going away um, and uh, the, 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 I think the bigger problem is that there are too many people left behind in a system. But that's it. One of the other pillars of Neil Ferguson's thesis is you, you've got immigration, and we see it in South Africa playing mm -hmm. out with xenophobia from time to time. Um, you've got the, the issues around corruption, perceived, real or otherwise. Um, then you've got the inequality yes. time bomb. And inequality is a global phenomenon. It's accentuated here in South Africa, as we all know. In the United States, more and more people feeling outside of the system. More and more people in Britain at Brexit time feeling outside yes. of, of the London loop, if you like. And that's a real risk for us here. It's a very real risk. I think the other issue that we, we also must understand about these elections in the United States now is, I mean, there's one feature that uh, some of the traditional Democrat heartlands, including uh, Michigan, where the auto sector has been based and the United Auto Workers Union has always been very strong and campaigning for Democrat uh, uh, candidates. Um, a lot of those people have turned away partly because uh, their life circumstances have changed mm -hmm. so rapidly and in such a short space of time. And the other issue uh, is that um, uh, the, the Republicans actually, I mean, Don Donald Trump got fewer votes than Mitt Romney did. Yes, and fewer votes than Hillary Clinton did. And fewer uh, votes yeah. of the popular vote, but mm -hmm. what is very clear is that the Democrats didn't pitch up. Mm. So even if people can't, can't cross the river uh, to support a Trump, uh, they just don't go and vote. Enough stayed away to put Trump into power, which achieves the same purpose as voting against Hillary. Exactly. Mm? Exactly. Uh, it's an extraordinary development. Would Bernie Sanders have done better? He was offering an alternative uh, Democratic option, Democratic Party option. Um, he lost out to Hillary Clinton. She emerged as the favoured candidate on the day. But could they have taken it with Bernie well, Sanders? It's a, it's a very interesting issue because neither Bernie Sanders nor Donald Trump are heartland of the party. Yeah. Uh, but B Bernie, nominally uh, a, a Democrat senator, but never quite mm. part of the, the party establishment, uh, argued the task, certainly had the ear of millennials and was rather strange mm. given his age and so on. Um, I think it may, have, it may have shifted the dial. I'm not quite sure what it would have done to traditional Democrats um, who are the coastal people. Yeah. Um, who are quite refined, uh, you know, one, one sees even uh, Paul Krugman um, in his regular column in the New York Times sort of being, being pretty outraged by the idea of Bernie, Bernie Sanders presidency. I haven't quite seen how he would weigh up in his own mind the choice between Trump Bernie and, and Trump. Yeah. No, it's an but look, it's been an extraordinary year from in terms of shifting political sands, mm -hmm. and, and there's there's lots of underlying social issues which are which are underneath it all, um, and, and we just have to look at, at, at the position in uh, that Europe finds itself now. Marie Le Pen in France yeah. must be licking her lips in anticipation. Um, Britain's left the European Union. Um, America's shown that it's up for a populist. She, is she next? But but but. You, you, and what you, is the consequence for the EU? Well, you you must extend that also into. Uh, the more recent uh, uh, joiners to the EU, uh, Eastern European mm. states, you look at Poland, uh, is Bulgaria in or, or oh, out? I think it's out. You think it's I out? I think it's out. Uh, it's so big and it's so fluid. <laughs> but that entire situation is, is unbelievably fluid and difficult. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I think we'll continue to watch Greece and try and understand what the trends are, uh, trend lines are, but from time to time, New Dawn rears its ugly head. Uh, it's the same kind of trend. Uh, Austria, I think that, that there's a, there's a neo-populism that brings uh, into mind shades of, of uh, the situation before World War II. Yeah. Now, I, I remember talking to David Blunkett about this in the in the throes of the financial crisis. You were otherwise mm. engaged at the, <laughs> at the time, <laughs> but in the throes of the financial crisis, uh, I, I said to him, "So, how does this play out over time?" And he goes, "It's a swing to the right in Europe, 
um, and almost inevitably financial crisis is followed by a neg negative or, or slow growth and a disassociation from the status quo and people then go towards the right they go towards traditional populism they go towards a beacon of hope which provides the space for the demagogue to rise but it, it's a very interesting issue that because I'm not even sure that, that the traditions of left and right yeah. are anywhere close to the place that they once were. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that David Cameron, right, mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, perhaps a, a David, uh, no, not David, uh, Ed uh, Miliband, Miliband mm -hmm. uh, left, mm -hmm. uh, didn't have a big gap between no. them. I think Theresa uh, uh, May has taken it further right. I think that that uh, Cor Jimmy Corbyn will, will will take it further right, uh, left. left yeah. um, but but in in broad and general terms, I think there's more occupying the centre. But when I see some of the articulation here in South Africa, I battle sometimes to understand um, whether the EFF in their arguments are left or right. Mm -hmm. Uh, or whether they are marching left, right, left, right, uh, because some of their, their statements are pretty xenophobic. Mm -hmm. uh, they wouldn't be substantially different from uh, the Swedish Democrats, for instance, on some of the issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on other issues, they have a distinctly left feel about them, and uh, one battles because I think that the, the cookie cutter doesn't work so well any longer. Thank you very much for joining Thanks us this evening. Former Finance Minister, he is currently Deputy Chairman of Rothschild in South Africa, Trevor Manuel. Other big issues, of course, to discuss on Future Money Makers. Till next time, have yourselves a very good evening. Good night.